What is God? Given exactly that definition, he said, "Now we all know what God is. God is an old man in the sky with a long white beard and blue white long hair." And I believe that perhaps this is one of the great problems that not only people who do not believe in God, but even people who do believe in God, have with this whole concept. I've never met an atheist who really had a fundamental working understanding of what is meant by the word God. And certainly during my life as an atheist, I had no concept whatsoever of what God was. The concepts and the ideas that I think most of us have about God are concepts that are not only logical, but concepts that are inconsistent with what the Bible has to say as well. I believe that God and the concept of God and the things that God does and the way that God works and perhaps even what God has not done that we think he ought to do are all things that are reasonable and logical and understandable if a person really comes to an understanding of what is meant by the concept of God. Now, in this discussion, we're treading on an area that many feel to be sacred ground, and, and perhaps we'll violate a lot of the traditional theological views about what God is, but I believe that God is reasonable, that the concept of God is reasonable, that it's rational, that a person doesn't have to leave their brains at home and forget about common sense when they talk about God. Now, I'm not suggesting that my ideas are any better than anybody else's. And I'm not suggesting that everything that I have to say here is uh, thus saith the Lord. Uh, a lot of it, frankly, is a uh, thus guesseth John Clayton. But I think it's important to recognize that we can present a logical, consistent viewpoint of God. We can present a model that is reasonable and consistent with common sense, with the Bible, and what intelligent thinking people who are willing to do a little thinking and a little work can come to really understand, come to really allow to be a functional part of their lives. I believe that Historically, there have been many misconceptions about what God is. We all have seen statues. We've all seen great paintings of God. We've all heard a lot of opera, a lot of music, a, a lot of read a lot of literature, seen a lot of things that have portrayed God in various contexts. My suggestion to you is that mankind as a whole throughout his history has been unable to grasp the concept of God in a reasonable way. And perhaps it has been because of our superstition. Perhaps it has been because in many areas men have, in fact, created gods as the atheist challenge to explain those things that they could not otherwise explain. But I believe that 20th century man has more tools than man has ever had to truly understand the nature of God. And so I want to ask you during this discussion together to be open-minded, to be fair, to be analytical, to think and to reason and to let your imagination be functional and, and see if you can't better understand at least that God is reasonable, that the concept of God is not irrational, that we can in fact realize that an all-powerful, perfect, all-knowing, omnipotent, omnipresent God can logically and consistently and rationally and reasonably create something, even something as inadequate and as ridiculous as I am, and do it with purpose, and do it with cause. I'd like to start this discussion by discussing a little bit about one of the problems we have in this area. Actually, the question about what God is is not as easy as some people might think, because God is not a being that exists in the three-dimensional world in which we live. Now, what does this word dimension mean? Well, suppose that I were to hand you a sheet of paper and, and I say to you, hey, uh, would, you, uh, would you draw a picture of me? Now, you sit down with that piece of paper and you look at me, uh, about six feet tall with not much hair and kind of ugly and kind of fat, and you start drawing a picture. Now, can you really get me in that sheet of paper? 
Now you think about that for a minute, you realize the answer is no. You can't get me in that sheet of paper. Why not? Because I'm a three-dimensional being. I have length and width and considerable thickness. But that sheet of paper that you have has only length and width, so you can't get me, a three-dimensional being, in that two-dimensional sheet of paper that has essentially only length and width. Now, you can draw a front view of me. You can draw a back view of me. You can draw a side view of me. You can do a, a top view of me, which <laughs> with my bald head, I guess, it'd be three concentric circles, but you can't get me in that sheet of paper. And the problem that you have there is not an unfamiliar problem. There's a book that I read many years ago. I haven't seen a copy of it for quite a while, but the concept of the book is demonstrated in figure two in the booklet that comes with this tape. In figure A of figure two, or drawing A of figure two, we, we've tried to represent what we have there as a sheet of paper. This book called Flatland, as I remembered, it was written by a man by the name of Square, Arthur Square, Flatland by A Square. <laughs> and it's a story about a man that lives in a two-dimensional sheet of paper. Now, he has uh, all the things that you and I have, except it's all in two dimensions. It's all in a world that exists only of length and width. And one day, this man living in his two-dimensional world is visited by a sphere, represented in B. And as the sphere crosses the plane of the man who lives in flat land in drawing A, all of a sudden a dot appears out of nothing. You see, the sphere has touched his plane. And as the sphere starts to cross his plane, that dot becomes a circle, and the man in Flatland gets scared. And as the sphere moves further down into the plane, the circle gets larger and larger and larger, and the man in Flatland is terrified. And just about the time he's ready to run away, he, he notices that all of a sudden the sphere, or the circle rather, is becoming a little bit smaller. And it becomes smaller and smaller. And of course what's happening is that the sphere is passing on through his plane. If you look at figure C, there's a representation there of a sphere crossing a plane. And you'll notice that the, the place where the plane is intersected by the sphere is a circle. And you see as that, as that sphere goes on through the circle, that, uh, through that piece of paper, that circle is going to become smaller and smaller. And so the man living in flatland watches and all of a sudden the thing becomes a point and then it just disappears. Well, he can't understand this. It isn't too long before he begins talking to the to the sphere, and he says, well, I don't understand what you are. And the sphere says, well, you see that circle there? And the man in Flatland says, yes. And the sphere says, well, now, suppose that you were to rotate that. And the man gets a hold of the circle, and he turns it in the plane of the paper, so all he does is simply turn it around, something like turning a dinner plate on the table. And the man in the sphere says, no, no, you're turning it the wrong way. And the man turns it the other way. Of course, he's just turning the plate clockwise now, whereas he was turning it counterclockwise a minute ago. And the man in the sphere says, no, 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 you've got to turn it the third direction. And the man living in Flatland says, there is no third direction. Because you see, in his world, there isn't. He lives in a flatland. He lives in a two-dimensional world, and the, the sphere is a three-dimensional surface. And, and the man living in the sheet of paper can't possibly understand what it's like to be a sphere. Now, that's the way it is with God. God says at one point, my ways are not your ways, my ways are higher than your ways. God is not a being that is limited to the three-dimensional world in which we live. He's not confined by length and width and height. Have you made God a molecular being restricted by the same dimensions that restrict you? If so, I suggest to you your God is too small. God is not a being restricted in that way. Scientists today are trying to decide whether the universe in which we live is, is planar, which means that it's flat like a sheet of paper and you just keep going forever and ever and ever, or whether it's elliptical, which means that if you go far enough to the east, eventually you come back in from the west, or may, whether maybe it's, it's hyperbolic, which means that if you go out in space, you turn, but you don't ever come back where you started. There's been some pretty good experiments that have shown that it's not flat. It's not planar. In other words, it seems that that space is either elliptical or hyperbolic, and, and that means it's closed. And if it's closed, what's on the other side? <laughs> well, our minds can't understand this because you and I live in a three-dimensional world. And our minds can't totally comprehend God either. Because when we conceptualize God, when we try to visualize and try and understand what God is, 
we have problems. That's why the Bible talks about God as by saying, for instance, such things as, as God is a spirit, John 4, 24. God is light, and in him is no darkness, 1 John 1 and verse 5. Paul, talking in Acts, the 17th chapter, and beginning with verse 22, talks about God, and, and he calls God, first of all, the unknown God, but then later on he goes on and he says that God is a being in whom we live and move. And have our being. Is that your concept of God? Is your concept of God a God in whom you live and move and have your being? Or, or have you made God a restricted being? You know, somebody might say at this point, well, there's only three dimensions. That there, there's only the length and the width and the height world in which we live. Now, now, actually, you know better than that. Let me demonstrate this to you. In exercise one in the book, I've got a little line there. And, and I'd like for you to write to the right of that word time a definition of time. You may want to turn off the tape recorder and, and write it down. I want you to define time. Give me a definition of time. What is time? Okay, now if you've done that, I, I think you've got probably something down there that's not really a definition. And probably a lot of you have said, well, this is nonsense. I can't do it. Now, you might have stated an equivalent. You might have said, well, time is distance over velocity. If I go a thousand miles, that at 100 miles an hour, it takes me 10 hours. Well, that's an equivalence, but that's not a definition. You can't define time. Because time is something that does not lie in our dimension. It doesn't have length and width and height. And so you can't give a definition of time. Some people refer to time as the fourth dimension. What they mean by that is that time lies beyond the three-dimensional context in which we live. Now, you can plot time against distance in some situ situations. You can plot time against pressure in some situations. There are lots of ways in which you can relate time to other things, but you can't actually define time. And there are many things like that. As a matter of fact, it's only been in recent times that we've been able to understand what light is, but we now understand light, not as a three-dimensional particle, but essentially as a two-dimensional particle. That's why you can polarize light. You can make light vibrate in one plane because essentially it is two-dimensional. It has, it's like the man in Flatland. It has length and it has width, but it has no thickness. And so you can polarize it. You can make it stay in one plane, but you're really talking about something there that, that is not three-dimensional in the most literal sense. Now let me make a parallel here. In exercise two, I'd like for you to write a definition of God. What is God? Write it down. You may want to turn off the recorder and think about this a little bit, and then we'll talk about it. Now, I suspect that once again you found yourself in some trouble, didn't you? You found yourself perhaps quoting a Bible passage which says something like, say, God is a spirit, or, or God is love, or God is light. Now, those are all biblical definitions, but, but what kind of definition is that? God is love. Now, if you've ever been in love, you'd probably recognize it's very difficult to define. You may be able to define the symptoms, and you may be able to state some properties of God. You may be able to describe God as he relates to time, or as he relates to space, or as he relates to matter, or as he relates to, to energy, or as he relates to power, or something like this. But, but really, you're finding it extremely difficult to define God. And the reason is because, once again, we're talking about a being. We're talking about a concept. We're talking about a parameter that is not physically restricted. You can't define time and you can't define God. You can't relate these things to such things as weight and, and gravity and length and acceleration and velocity and height and all these other things that are easily measurable and easily determinable. Now the interesting thing is that the Bible confronts this same problem with essentially the same results. I'd like to encourage you to to study the passages listed in figure three. Now, I might add here that we have not in any sense or form tried to make an exhaustive list of every definition that the Bible gives of God. But I'd like for you to look through those definitions and notice that some of them define God in terms of spiritual qualities. Some of them define him negatively, like, for instance, Matthew 16, 17, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father. So God is clearly not flesh and blood. 
Even the description of man, which we talked about in tape number three, deals with the concept of God that is not a physical concept. And then when we look a little bit further and we read on over into passages like, for instance, the passage that we mentioned a minute ago, found in Acts, the 17th chapter, or when we look at passages that relate so closely to the description of God, such as the various passages in Psalms, we begin to recognize that the descriptions given of God throughout the Bible are descriptions that do not define God in physical terms. As a matter of fact, the very opposite is involved. Passages like 2 Peter 3 and verse 8 define God as being a being independent of time. We read passages that talk about God in a sense that puts him totally isolated from space, such as Jeremiah 23, 23, and 24. I think the important thing to recognize is that these descriptions given of God are descriptions that perhaps many people find difficult to accept. And yet, with what man knows today, with the discoveries that have been made in science in recent years, it is possible, I believe, to prove that these descriptions are rational, logical, intelligent concepts, and that we can intelligently believe in God as the Bible describes Him. Now let's lay down a principle that we talked about briefly and hinted at perhaps a little bit in, in tape number three, but I'd like to define this concept or give you a definition of it and pursue it in much more depth. In figure four, there's a definition of a word which is called par parity. Parity is defined, as you see there, as a mirror image relationship. For every situation that exists or for every condition that there is or for every created thing, you'll find some books say, there is always a mirror image. For every left-handed situation, there's a right-handed situation. For every positive, there's a negative. Now, how do we use this? Well, it's used in many areas. In biology, they have a concept similar to this, which is known as bilateral symmetry. If something has a left eye, it's going to have a right eye. If something has a left lung, it's going to have a right lung. And we also, of course, have seen the same sort of thing in psychology because in many cases, psychologists will talk about such things as id or ego and, and sort of present them as opposing forces or opposites. Let me give you an illustration from my field of physics which is the only area that I know very much about. And, and let me show you how this sort of thing has been used. And actually, the first time that this kind of use was made was by a man by the name of Albert Einstein, who I think most of you have heard of, a very brilliant man who used parity in some very practical ways in physics. Now, in Figure 5, we have some definitions of a particle that was known to exist in the time of Einstein. And Einstein pointed out to us that, that we know that there are things which are called electrons. As you'll notice on the left-hand side of the chart, we know that these things have a negative charge. We don't know what causes it, but we know that they have it. We know that they spin a certain way in a certain kind of magnetic field, let's say clockwise. We know they have a certain kind of mass, and we know that that mass is 118,837, the mass of a proton. And we call this thing an electron. Now, these are a set of diagnostic properties that exist for this particle, which we call the electron. Now, Einstein said all the way back in 1904, now look, gentlemen, speaking to the scientific community, one day you're going to find the parity form of an electron. It's going to have a positive charge instead of negative. It's going to spin counterclockwise instead of clockwise in a certain kind of magnetic field. It's going to have what Einstein called an anti-mass, which will be one one eight hundred thirty-seven thousandth of the mass of a proton. And he said this particle then will be an antimatter particle. Somebody says, antimatter, what's that? Well, Einstein said, antimatter will be a form of matter which, when put together with ordinary matter, will destroy it, producing nothing but energy. Now, everybody said at that time, well, <laughs> sure, Uncle Albert, what have you been smoking? Didn't make any sense. But in 1932, Dr. Carl Anderson discovered a particle which we now know as a positron. And we can demonstrate these particles in wholesale amounts in laboratories. They have a positive charge. They spin counterclockwise in the same magnetic field that electrons spin clockwise in. They, they do, in fact, have an anti-mass 1 1,837th mass of proton, which means that when you put them together with ordinary electrons, they annihilate one another, producing nothing but energy. And the particle is called a positron. And since that time, we have discovered antiprotons, antineutrons. These are everyday working things in the field of nuclear physics. 
Now, all I've tried to do here is to show you how the concept of parity is used. It has very practical applications. Now, I'd like to suggest to you that, that we can bring this down to a subject that relates to God. And we talked about this a little bit in tape number three, but I'd like to elaborate on it a little bit. You see, we can recognize that for man, time is finite. And we've got this more or less organized for you in figure five in the booklet, so you can follow along. Time is finite for me. There's not much I can do to speed up time. There's not much I can do to slow down time. Time fast, passes for me in a very regular rate. I, I can't accelerate it. I can't decelerate it. Or I can make some, some minor changes by adjusting my velocity. But basically, time is fixed for man. Now, what would the opposite be of finite time? Well, I suggest to you that it would be infinite time. A being that would occupy such a condition would be a being that would occupy all points of space and all points of time as now. Now, actually, this concept was first advanced by Albert Einstein. He said to us, time is relative. Time is not a fixed quantity. Time, in fact, depends upon the condition or the situation of the observer. Now, my point is this. I don't think there's any rational question any longer about the fact that time is not finite. And it can be shown, as we'll see in a few minutes, that time can accurately be defined as infinite. Well, what's the significance? Well, you remember back in figure three, some of the passages that described God, like for instance, 2 Peter 3 and verse eight, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that a day is unto the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. What's he saying? He's saying that God looks at time the way you look at this workbook. You can see the beginning of it and you can see the end of it. That's the way it is with God and time. Every instant of time is now to God. And the concept of parity says, yes, that is reasonable. That is logical. It is perfectly rational to believe that there could be a being that could occupy all points of time as now. Now, he would not be a three-dimensional being. But we've already pointed out that God is not a three-dimensional being. God possesses all points of time as if they were now. You can even move further with this analogy. Now, the space that I occupy is fixed. Yeah, unfortunately, it's been increasing somewhat over the last several years, but nonetheless, I can't do anything instantaneously, at least, to make any meaningful change in the space that I occupy. For man, space is finite. But what would parity suggest? Well, I suggest to you that the parity form of finite space would be infinite space. That a being who would occupy such a condition would fill all points of space simultaneously. Now, once again, as we have pointed out in one of our other tapes, this is a description that we read about in the Bible. God talking about himself. In Jeremiah 23, verses 23 and 24, says, Am I God near at hand, and not a God afar off, saith the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? Now, is that reasonable? Well, Parity says, yes. Yes, in fact, there ought to be a being that would fulfill those descriptions, a being that would occupy all points of spaces now. And this is why the Bible talks about God as a being in whom we live and move and have our being. This is why we refer to God as light, as love, as a spirit, because we're talking about a being that fills the whole cosmos. He's here and in Andromeda at the same time. He occupies all points of space simultaneously. That description of God is reasonable and rational. Now, somebody at this point can say, well, well now, wait a minute. Well, how do you know that your application of parity is right? Because certainly you could conceptualize the parity form of time as negative time. I don't know how you would do it with negative space, really, but you certainly could question whether or not this would be a valid interpretation of the things about which we've been talking. But in figure six, you'll notice four equations, which I believe Einstein has given, which show us conclusively that the applications that I have made here of parity are accurate and logical and reasonable. The first equation is one I suspect most of you have seen. We discussed it briefly in tape three. It's an equation for time. T is the time something or someone experiences. T zero is the time they experience if they're not moving relative to a fixed frame of reference. V is the speed of light, and C, or V is the speed you're moving, and C is the speed of light. Now, if V approaches C, then the value of V squared over C squared approaches 1, 
and the denominator of that fraction becomes 1 minus almost 1. So t0 divided by 1 minus almost 1 is almost 0. So t becomes infinitely large. Now, if you understand the algebra, that makes sense. And if you don't understand the algebra, it never would make sense. So don't worry about it. The point is, time is not a fixed quantity. We know that equation's right. We've taken particles called neutrons, put them in particle accelerators, gotten them up near the speed of light, and they live instead of for 18 minutes, as they do at rest, for hours. We've taken cesium clocks, put them in high-speed aircraft, flying in opposite directions, and the clocks slow down exactly as that formula suggests. What's that saying? That's saying that time becomes longer, even for a physical quantity, as your speed increases. Some of you might notice that if V got bigger than C, you'd end up with a, an imaginary number, which basically indicates a dimension change. And that's exactly the concept we're pointing out. I might also point out to you that the second equation, B, an equation for mass, and the fourth equation, D, the equation of the relationship between force, mass, and acceleration, show the same concept. Equation B shows that if you get near the speed of light, the space that you occupy, the quantity of matter that you have, becomes infinitely large. And equation D shows that if the mass becomes infinitely large, then the force to accelerate that mass becomes infinitely large. So what does that say? That says that man will never reach the speed of light, because if man got up near the speed of light, his mass would become infinitely large, and the force to accelerate such a mass would also become an infinitely large, so man will never reach the speed of light, never exceed it. The point is here that the descriptions that we have been talking about, about space being finite for man, are proven by these equations. You can't get beyond those conditions that would put a limitation on space. You can't get to a situation where you could reverse time. For man, time is finite and space is finite. But we can see the reasonableness of describing a being who is not finite, either in time or space, by these equations. Now, just to see if you understand this, I'd like for you to take exercise three and answer three questions in A, B, and C, and then we'll sort of try and put this all together. In exercise three, question A, I'd like for you to write down what happens to time as a physical object approaches the speed of light. In B, I'd like to write, have you write, what happens to mass when the speed of something approaches the speed of light? And in C, I'd like for you to write, what happens to the force to speed something up when the mass approaches infinity? And then we'll resummarize this on the other side of the tape and talk about whether it is reasonable for God to have created me. Now, I hope as you thought about these things that you began to recognize more fully what we're actually driving at here. What we're asking here is, is the description given of God in the Bible reasonable and logical and rational to believe? Can we really accept the idea that there could be a being which is like what the Bible describes God to be? Now, as you work through exercise three, figure A, or part A, I hope that you said that when the speed of something approaches the speed of light, the time slows down. As a matter of fact, if you could reach the speed of light, essentially time would not pass, is the suggestion of that equation up in figure six, part A. Let me put this another way. If I could take you right now and put you in a spaceship, and send you out to a star a thousand light years away, and you were to travel at the speed of light for a thousand years and then turn around and come back for a thousand years by your watch, you would not age one bit while you were gone. But the earth might age two thousand years while you were gone. No time. Time would stop. Now somebody says, that's irrational. I can't understand that. No, I can't either. But that's the way this creation is built, and we know that that equation is true and that it does apply and it does work. The description of the relationship between God and time, implying that God created time, that God does not experience the passage of time, that every instant of time is now to God, is a reasonable, logical, consistent point of view. The second equation is saying the same thing, part B, about mass. Mass is the quantity of material something occupies. And theoretically, even a physical object that could reach the speed of light would fill the whole cosmos. The mass would become infinite. It would have an infinite quantity of material. 
Now, part C in the figure 6 equation shows it also becomes shorter in the direction of motion. So there's many dimensional transitions involved, and of course nothing could ever reach it, which we'll point out in just a minute. But again, the point is that the concept of God as a being in whom we live and move and have our being, as a being who fills the whole cosmos, that is, here and in the galaxy, Beutis at the same time, as a reasonable, logical, consistent, rational belief. And exercise three, part C, is simply trying to drive home the point that man is limited to the dimension in which we live. Because since mass becomes infinite when you get near the speed of light, the force to accelerate something to the speed of light would also have to be infinite. And the only thing that possesses infinite force is God. Therefore, God is the only being that can exist in his dimension. I might point out here that any being can create in a lower dimension. You're a three-dimensional being, and you can create in any dimension lower than the dimension in which you live. By that I mean that you can create in a two-dimensional sheet of paper. You don't have any trouble at all drawing pictures on a, on a two-dimensional sheet of paper. You can even create in a system that is in the same dimension you are. God, then, has complete control in the dimension in which we live. God has as much control on this earth as you have on a sheet of paper, at least potentially. Now, somebody says, well, now, wait a minute. If God has that much control, if God fills all of time and space, if, if God is all-knowing and all-powerful and permeates all of time and all of space, then why in the world did he create man? In exercise four, I've asked you to prejudice this discussion with your understanding. Write down why you think God created man, and be very careful, because <laughs> there are so many traps you can get into here, and, and of course I'm going to stick my neck out too in a few minutes, but I'd like for you to stick yours out first before you criticize my explanation, see if yours is any better. So write down in exercise four why did a perfect God, all-knowing and unlimited by time and space, create you? I gave you an impossible job, you say? I hope that maybe that's your attitude. If so, maybe you'll learn something in this discussion. Some of the things I hope you did not say, I hope you did not say that God created man because God was lonely. <laughs> you see, if God is an all-powerful God and if God is all-knowing, then certainly God is not going to be lonely. Loneliness is something that man experiences, but it would not be part of an omnipotent being to be lonely. Somebody else says, well, God needed companionship. God has no needs. If you're really going to define God as an all-powerful God, then God has no needs. Now, somebody else says, well, uh, God just playing fun and games, just having a good time. I don't really believe that that explanation is going to be accepted by a human being who views himself as of any value at all. God did not create us just to torment us, just to play with us, just to have fun with us. I believe God had a real reason to create me. I, I think I serve a purpose, and it's not just, just egotism. It's based upon common sense and upon what the Bible says and upon what I see around me. Now, I'd like to lead you through a discussion here, and I hope that perhaps you'll think very carefully about some of the ideas that I'm suggesting to you. In exercise 5, part A, I'd like for you to write down what you think the parity form of good is. What is the parity form of good? I hope perhaps if you wrote that down in a way that I think most of us would probably think of it, you would recognize that the opposite of good is evil. All right, in exercise five, part B, write down the parity form of love. What is the parity form of love? Now, I hope perhaps that you wrote down hate. I think it's obvious that good and evil, love and hate are parity forms. They are mirror images of one another. Now, what's my point? My point is that I believe in this we can see that God did not create evil. Now, I realize that, that modern theology, that all of the great theologians and the great scholars have taken the position that God created evil. 
But I suggest to you there's no biblical base for that. There are many things that have been existent in this world not because God created them, but because they came in as a consequence of God's creation. Look at all the things man has done. Man has certainly created certain things. Most of them undesirable, but he has created certain things. And God, by creating man, allowed these things to come into being. There's only one passage in the whole Bible that says or implies in any way, shape, or form that God created evil. And that's Isaiah 45 and verse 7 where God says he creates evil. But if you look at the Hebrew word used here, you'll see that it is not used in the sense that he creates evil. As a matter of fact, the King James is the only translation I've seen that translates this verse this way. Normally the context of the verse is that God allows evil, that God permits conditions to come about where evil can take place. As a matter of fact, most translations don't use the word evil. They use bad or unpleasantries or unfortunates, things that happen to man that man would rather didn't happen. It is really not the absolute use of the word evil. Now, what I'm saying to you is this. I believe that evil came into existence as the result or as the consequence of God's existence. If God is good, then automatically there's going to be the absence of good, which is evil. If God is love, then automatically there's going to be the opposite of love, which is hate. If God is light, then there's going to automatically be the opposite of light, which is darkness. I'm suggesting to you that evil and hate and all the bad things on the earth came into being as the result of or as the consequence of God's existence himself. I don't think God created evil. Now, let me explain logically why I think that's necessary. If you take the position that God created evil so that men could sin and be lost eternally, you have God deliberately promoting a situation that caused people to be lost eternally. I think that's inconsistent with the nature of God. I don't think it's God's will that any should be lost. And certainly the easiest way to avoid anybody being lost was not to create anybody to begin with. But I think there was a far more noble purpose for man's creation. I suggest to you that evil came into existence as a consequence of God's existence. Now, somebody says, well, now, boy, you got, you got yourself in trouble there because now you've got a dualism. You've got God equal to Satan. Now, whoa, I haven't even mentioned Satan yet. And I'm not even suggesting to you that, that good and evil are equal because a force like good or a force like evil has no value at all of its own. No intrinsic value at all unless it is personified. Now, let me show you what I mean by that. Let's suppose that I've got a piece of pornographic literature here. Boy, this is really raunchy stuff. And I set it over here on the desk and nobody looks at it. Does that pornographic material have any influence? Does it have any force? Does it have any value? Does it have any purpose or any function? Does it influence anyone? Well, of course not. Nobody reads it. Evil had no value. Evil had no function until there was something for it to be personified in. There's no dualism. Good was superior. Love was perfect because there was no personification of evil. There was no personification of hate. But love was personified in God and good was personified in God. Well, then what happened? Well, as I said to you at the beginning of the tape, this isn't a thus saith the Lord, this is a thus geth as John Clayton, but I begin to find some biblical base for my position at this point because it seems that we're not the only thing that God's created. Apparently, God has created many other beings, but these beings are not physical beings. These beings are beings that are a little superior to man. We're told that God created man a little lower than the angels. And these beings, I suggest to you, are called angels by the Bible. Now, I don't know why God created them. But they, being spirit beings, are beyond our understanding. They're in another dimension, as we've already discussed. So God created these other beings. And as a necessary part of their makeup to serve God, these beings had to have the capacity of distinguishing or being able to choose between good and evil. And the Bible tells us that some of them chose good and some of them chose evil. Second Peter 2 and verse 4, for example, we're told that if God spared not the angels that sinned, 
but cast them down to hell. Angels sin. It says so right there in 2 Peter 2, 4. And in figure 7, we've listed these verses so that you can see them in their context or see them laid out one by the other. There's no question, according to, to 2 Peter 2, 4, that angels sin. In Jude 6, we read, And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. And then it goes on to what's happened to them. In figure 7, we've listed some other descriptions of Satan that imply the same idea we're dealing with here, especially 1 Timothy 3, 6, in which it talks about, at least in some translations, being careful about falling into the same condemnation that Satan did. Now, I suggest to you that these angelic beings had the opportunity to sin, and some of, some of them took that opportunity because the Bible says so. All right, now what? Well, now God's got a problem, and now we turn away from anything that God spells out for us, and once again, we have to use our God-given intelligence, maybe a little imagination, and once again, I emphasize this is not a thus saith the Lord, it's a thus gets John Clayton, but I think that the indication is here that, that God had a problem, a problem that you and I have been confronted with. Here he has a group of beings that have rebelled against him. Now, how's he going to demonstrate the superiority of his way, of his system, the superiority of of good and love over hate and evil as personified in these angels like Satan who have turned against God. Well, the situation is comparable to situations that you and I have in our everyday walks of life. Let's suppose that I've got an idea. Man, I tell you, this idea is fantastic. It's going to make me a million dollars. I just know it is. But before I put my life savings into this thing, my 25 cents, <laughs> I want to test it. So how do I test it? Well, I find me a worthy adversary, like you, for instance. And I find me a piece of paper, a lower dimension. And I create or express myself in that lower dimension. I expose my idea to you on a sheet of paper, and I say, Hey, buddy, what do you think about this? Didn't this look like a good idea? Don't you think this thing might be real successful? Now, if my idea is an unworthy idea, you're going to tear it up. You're going to say, well, now, look, you dummy, you made this mistake and that mistake and that mistake, and this isn't going to work because of this, this, and this. You're going to show me in no uncertain terms that my idea is unworthy. You're going to destroy my creation. Now, I could pull out a gun and shoot you, but would that prove anything about my creation? I suggest to you that God has created us for the same purpose. We are a lower dimension. He has created us in a lower state to demonstrate the superiority of good over evil. And I don't care what you do, you are going to show the superiority of good over evil because if you choose to spit in God's face and to turn against God, you're going to suffer the consequences of that, not just in this life, but in the hereafter also. So even if you reject God, you'll show the superiority of his system. And if you accept God's system and live God's system, not only are you going to experience the beauties of it in this life, but also in the hereafter. So no matter which way you go, you will show the superiority of God's system over Satan's. Now, is there any basis in the Bible for what I've said? Does my, does my model have any biblical support whatsoever? Well, I believe it does. Turn over to Job, the first chapter. And we didn't put this in the booklet because there's so many passages involved. But I hope you will follow with me because I'm going to do a Clayton paraphrase here and, and I want you to see what the real wording is and that I'm not abusing the, the context or what the Bible says in these matters. Job, the first chapter, beginning with the sixth verse. Now there was a day when the sons of God, or angels of God, some translations say, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Where you been? Now I'm starting to paraphrase here. And Satan said, Well, I've been hacking around the earth. I've been going all over the place. And... and uh, God says, well, hey, old buddy, did you notice my friend Job down there? I'm in verse 8. The King James says, an upright man, one that feareth God, and a show with evil. It means that he stays completely away from it. He doesn't have anything to do with it. And Satan says, well, why not? You've got a silver spoon in his mouth. He doesn't have any problems. He doesn't have any needs. Take away all the goodies, and he'll spit in your face. And God says, well, all right, you go down there and take them away and see what happens. Notice it is not God that afflicts Job. God does not create evil but he allows Job to be exposed to this. Now, you know what happens. If you don't, you can read it there. Satan goes down, and, and Job loses some of his family and his possessions, and, man, he has just all kinds of terrible things happen. 
All right, we come to the second verse, or second chapter, rather, the first verse. Again there was a day when the angels of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Where you been? I've been hacking around the earth. You see my buddy Job? How about that? I'll let you go down there and take away all the goodies. And he still stayed with me. He didn't embrace your crummy system. What do you think about that, Satan? And Satan says, Well, all right, you won that one. But, uh, I'm in verse 4, but, but uh, you, you hit his body. You let him suffer, Lord, and, and he'll spit in your face. And God says, all right, you go down there and hurt him physically, but don't kill him. Verse 6. Notice that God still provides the limits. And notice that it's not God that afflicts Job. Well, you know what happens. Job suffers boils. He has terrible time. And somebody might look at this and say, well, well this is ridiculous that, that God would allow Job to suffer so terribly and to have such a miserable time just to prove to Satan that Job wasn't going to have anything to do with his system. Well, let's see how Job looked at it. Turn over to the 42nd chapter, the 5th verse, at the end of the whole incident. And Job says in verse 5, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. And you'll notice that Job goes on to praise God and, and that God blesses Job and that, and that the whole thing is viewed by Job as a very positive thing. What do you think 75 years of suffering here upon the earth is going to look like from the vantage point of eternity? I suggest to you you're not even going to remember how much pain you suffered here. You go to the dentist and you have a Novocaine shot. Why? because you don't mind suffering a, a few minutes or a few seconds to get away from what seems like the hours of suffering that goes with that drill. You see, in the beauty of eternity, we're not going to remember the suffering we've had here. I suggest to you there's nothing that can happen to you here that will compare to the blessings of eternity. I think that this presents a rational reason why God created man. Now, it perhaps isn't the only method that God could have used, and it may not be the only method God is using. We know that's what God's doing here. We don't know what he's doing in outer space. We don't know what other test might be going on. All we know is that it is reasonable for God to have created me. I serve a purpose, a cosmic purpose. I am valuable and useful, and there's a real direction and a real purpose in my life. But now may I suggest to you that if you take an opposing point of view, if you're an atheist, for example, what is the purpose of your life? I've got a mentally retarded son. It's been a real tragedy in my life. But I can view this as something that God has allowed me to take, allowed me to suffer, to show that Christians can be faithful and productive and useful even in the face of that tragedy. If an atheist had the same situation, what way out would he have? I suggest to you he would not have any easy way out. And I could point out many other tragedies that have been a part of my life and the life of others that we can look at and understand and realize, well, all right, this is terrible and we don't like it and we wish it wasn't happening, but but we'll take it here because we've only got a short time here and then we've got eternity with God. I have everything to gain and nothing to lose by believing that my purpose is the one I have just described. And I suggest to you the atheist has nothing to gain and everything to lose by taking the opposite point of view. Now we could go on here and talk about what heaven and hell are but I think we've laid down enough principles that you can see they're not physical places. They're places that God has prepared, they're parody environments where God has placed a permanent barrier between the forces of Satan and the forces of God. Abraham said to the rich man in the story of the rich man and Lazarus that there was a great gulf fixed that nobody could go across. You're not going to die and then be given a map that says go past the third star and turn right and you'll find heaven on your left. Heaven is a spiritual existence. We're going to have a new body. We're told in Peter that when the end comes that even the elements are going to be melted. The experiment will be over. That could happen before we get this tape to you. 
It could happen a thousand years from now. But it will happen. Where will you stand? Will you, you have served the purpose that God created you for? In a positive way? Or in a negative way? It will be one or the other. My prayer and my plea is that you will understand the nature of God. A loving, merciful God that is not willing that any should be lost, but by the same token, is not going to force anybody to accept his way. It's your choice. But I hope that you see a purpose for your life. A grand and a glorious and a beautiful purpose. And a purpose that has a great promise and that you will dedicate yourself to achieving that goal by giving yourself to your God, to your Creator.